I am in something of a recording marathon. I have four books that I've read that I've yet to record the videos for. I've been meaning to do it for weeks. I've just been so booked and busy. So I'm gonna squeeze them all into this lovely Saturday evening, afternoon, morning. But before I get into anything, I of course have to address the newest happy news on the channel, which is that we just hit a thousand subscribers. Oh my god, that's literally so crazy. I can't believe it. I was actually looking through um, some of my Instagram highlights that I have. I have one where it's like, like exciting news and it's really cute because I had posted at one point. I was like, oh my god, we hit 10 subscribers and then now I'm at a thousand. I'm a little bit in denial. I'm like, this isn't happening. Like, who am I? What? <laughs> I don't know. It's like a weird feeling. Um, but I'm so thankful and I'm so happy. We're in a new era of this channel now, so I'm excited and scared all at the same time. So before I get into anything book related, I do want to bring up, you may or may not have noticed on this video that there were some ads that were not there before. That's a big bird that's outside. Okay, sorry, I'm distracted. So since I hit a thousand subscribers, I am now a YouTube partner. Yay! So that means that I have monetized content now. So I mentioned in my like get to know me video, if you watch that, it's right here. If you haven't, you should. But I mentioned that I would never really want to monetize my content because it's not something that I do for a source of income. This is truly a hobby for me and I'm very grateful and very blessed to not have to do this as a primary source of income. But the reason that I am choosing to monetize my videos now is, and I'll explain why right now. So as I said in that video and what I've kind of like held myself to since the start of all of this is that anything that I gain from this channel, I want to like pour back into the channel, if that makes sense. So to celebrate all these new accomplishments for the first month, um, so I don't know what day this video will go out, but uh, foreseeably I'm going to guess like for the month of June, any revenue that I am getting from monetizing my videos will go straight to donations. Right now I'm compiling a list of charities and GoFundMes that I want to uh, donate the money to. So however much money I raise in a month and or once we hit $100 because transparency, they don't like pay out YouTube creators until you hit like $100. So if it takes me six months to get to 100, that first 100 is gonna go to charity. So I'm going to compile a list of charities and I'll probably put up a poll um, on the community tab and on some of my social medias to uh, get like the percentages of how much will be going to each charity. And of course, if any of you guys have any charities that you are particularly very fond of or you are passionate about their mission, please feel free to to send them to me in my direction. Because yeah, I think the social aspect of my channel is something that has been very present since the beginning and something that I wanna continue doing as I grow as a creator and as we grow as a channel. So thank you. So yeah, I just wanted to put that out there right now and uh, for everyone to know. So yeah, my videos going forward will be monetized, but I will be putting aside the money for donations and other things for the channel. Um, I honestly, I have no idea like how this is all gonna work. I don't really understand it. So this first month will, of course, all that money will be going to donations, um, but it'll also serve as like a kind of test run because I don't I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't know anything about how monetization works or anything like that. I thought what better way to test it out than try and you know, raise money. So yeah, all you have to do is just continue watching my videos like normal um, and I will do all the rest. So thank you to all of you guys for getting me to this point in my YouTube channel slash career now, I guess. Again, just so everyone knows for the first month, probably the month of June, just like based on when this video will go out uh, for the month of June, all the ad revenue I'm getting from these videos will be put aside so that we can donate it to charity. And it's either how much money I raise in this month and or until we get to $100. $100 is the minimum. We'll see how it plays out. But trust you me, more donations and more uh, interactions with charities will continue to take place on this channel. TLDR, the only thing you need to be concerned about is that now my videos will have ads. Probably not a lot of them. Again, I don't really know how that all works, but yeah, you'll just be getting a few ads now. And by watching those ads, you will be contributing to charity. Anyway, back to the video. Okay, so 
I have book mail. Now, hold on, hold on. What did I say about the pitchforks? Put them away. Don't, don't come at me. Give me, let me explain in the sense that. So the book we're gonna be reviewing today, um, there was actually a pre-order campaign that went along with it. So I pre-ordered the book and along with the beautiful book that I got, I also was supposed to get some like pre-order gifts with it. And for the longest time, I was like, man, they ran out and I never got my pre-order gift. I was a little sad about it because I had already planned to put it up on this wall with my other poster. She's been so sad by herself, but I was like, eh, whatever. Like, what are you gonna do? They ran out, it's fine. I was like, oh, you know, maybe I can commission someone to do some art and I can just like put it up here, it'll be fine. But then, so I was like waiting literally by the mailbox, like being like, oh, maybe it just like got lost in transit or whatever. And then first I got this one and I was like, okay, yeah, slay, perfect. I got my little pre-order gift, but then, and. It, Funny enough, and maybe it was a good thing I didn't record the video until now, but later, like sometime last week, I got this package in the mail. And I was like, what the heck? <laughs> I was really confused. So then I got this in the mail, and this actually I knew what it was because back a while ago, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see I posted on my story that I had bought these stickers. And essentially when you bought them, it raised money and it was like essentially a donation um, to help people in the place where watermelons grow and they're very delicious, very nutritious, but just to make sure that watermelons continue to grow. So if you're really passionate about watermelons, someone might like buy these stickers, which is why I bought these stickers. So I have a lot of things to open. I'm, I'm gonna start with this one because this one actually says that it's from Macmillan, which is uh, the publisher that I was supposed to Oh, it's kind of open. Um, so Macmillan is the publisher that was doing the pre-order campaign for this book. All right, let's see what it is together. Oh, ooh. This is a signed book plate by Judy I. Lynn for Song of the Six Realms, which I guess I was trying to hide it until after I opened all this. But yeah, the book we're reviewing today is Song of the Six Realms. <laughs> I also matched my little eye jewels to like the color theme because it's like purple. I think my book is already signed. You know, I might as well do a little like book tour. Here it is. I ordered this from the UK as opposed to ordering it from uh, the US because of this special little edition. Do you see this? Look how beautiful this is. Like, do you see that? Like, it's just so majestic, so magical. Um, now for the big one. This is the one I was really excited about. Um, okay, it does have a little tab here. So I'm just gonna pull that. Oh, I guess my left hand is stronger than my right. Okay. Okay, yeah, 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 here it is, here it is. Okay, ready? Uh... Oh my God, look at that. Look, I know it's kind of like bright and shiny in here, but do you see, oh my God, even like the gold parts of it, this is so pretty. Lovely. Art print by Carissa Susilo. I hope that is how you say that. Thank you, Carissa. This is so beautiful. You slayed. You ate. So collectively, this is all the beautiful stuff that I got. Again, just for buying one book. Like this, this, this is a warranted purchase, okay? Now we're gonna open up these stickers. So I'm excited. Oh no, it's kind of bent. Wait, what? It, they put an envelope inside another envelope. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Ta-da! Oh, I dropped one. Look at that. Reading is resistance. It is. If you watch a uh, Crash Course, uh, the YouTube videos from John Green, there's a sticker he had on his laptop and it said like, this machine kills fascists or something like that. I'm gonna put this on my laptop and then put it in my video so that it'll be like the same thing. My hands are so shaky, I'm so sorry. This is like so bad for trying to show off like products. Like they're books and it's a little watermelon. And then the last sticker I have is this one. Just like a cute little circle. You know, just reading for funsies, reading all about watermelons. You know, watermelons are actually really good for you. And in this beautiful season of almost summer, it's really important that we talk about watermelons because watermelons are the perfect thing to consume in summer. So that was all the stuff I got. So now we get into the actual book session of this video where we talk about Song of the Six Realms by Judy I. Lynn. This is her most recent publication. It came out, I think, April 26th. Also, as a side note, the voice actress that does uh, the audiobooks for Judy I. Lynn's books, oh my God, she's so good. Like, I I don't know what it is. She's so enchanting. I love her voice. I like listened to the audiobook for A Magic Steeped in Poison and this one. She ate, she gobbled up 
that script oh my god so song of the six realms is a standalone romance novel it's about this girl her name is okay it's been a little bit of a long time since i read the book i actually read it like the first week of may and we are now at may 26th i am again going to apologize in advance if i mispronounce these names i have like my own personal punctuation punctuation uh pronunciation guide but um i might be wrong so i apologize so i'm actually going to read it from the summary of the book because i'm blanking so badly right now um sure a talented young musician has no past and probably no future Orphaned at a young age, her kindly poet uncle arranged for an apprenticeship at one of the most esteemed entertainment houses in the kingdom. When her uncle is killed in a bandit attack, she is devastated to lose her last connection to a life outside her indenture contract. With no family and no patron, Shara faces a lifetime of servitude until one night. She is unexpectedly called to put on a private performance for the enigmatic Dukmong. The young man is strangely kind and surprises Shur with an irresistible offer. Serve as a musician in residence at his manor for one year and he'll set her free of her indenture. When the duke whisks her away to his estate, she discovers he's not just some country noble. He's the Duke of Dreams, one of the divine rulers of the celestial realm. The six realms are on the brink of disaster and the duke needs to unlock memories from Shur's past which could help to stop the impending war. But first, Shrey must survive being the target of every monster and deity in the six realms. Again, from the summary, she essentially starts off in this entertainment house. Uh, she is a chin player. So the chin is a plucked seven string Chinese musical instrument. It has been played since ancient times and has traditionally been favored by scholars and literati as an instrument of great subtlety. So this whole story, it's honestly like kind of slay. I really like the concept of it because it's all very like music based. So she is in this entertainment house as a chin player and she is incredibly gifted. She's very good at it. So one night, as I said in the summary, Duke Mong comes to visit her and she like plays him a song and at first like everything is going kind of good kind of like she's she's like why did you call on me because essentially it's like her first day performing as like a public chin player because she was doing like private performances where she would like be behind like a screen people weren't like there for her specifically but soon afterwards she kind of gets recognized as like being like good enough to play by herself so she is put like on display for all these people to watch her play the chin and like quickly afterwards duke mong comes to see her and is like i would like you to play me a song a little private performance if you will and she's like okay that's really weird so she puts on her private performance for him and he is asking specifically about her chin because her instrument is very ornate. It's red. It has a lot of like beautiful decals and it's one of a kind. It's made by one specific person and um, some eccentrics collect these instruments that this person made. And she believes that he's there to collect her instrument and buy it off her and she's like absolutely not my beloved uncle gave this to me you're not getting it and he's like okay fine but then while they're in the gardens and while she's putting on this performance for him they hear a commotion while they're in the gardens someone else that is a member of this house is being attacked by a vicious monster sure is like freaked out she's like what is this thing um duke mong immediately swoops in to help take down the monster. Um, he's very quickly overpowered. Shura being the girl boss queen that she is, immediately figures out, oh, this thing is really sensitive to sound. So she hits like a gong or something like, like these wind chimes, I think. She hits it, um, disorients the monster, and then Duke Mong is able to kill it. So she gets injured and then afterwards she's like, oh my God, what was that that I just saw? What was that thing that you just fought? And he's like, um, don't worry about it. <laughs> So eventually he calls on her again, calls on her like it's Bridgerton. <laughs> I'm sorry, I did watch the series. Ah! So the real story begins once Duke Mong is like, hey, why don't you come to my estate, be my private little musician, and I will set you free after a year. And she's like, hmm, okay. So she goes to the estate and lo and behold, it's not just some regular degular estate. He's not just some regular degular rich dude. He is the Duke of Dreams because, and this is like a, a pun i guess because like mong also means dreams but that's like his name so i think if you like spoke mandarin it would be like a, a nice little pun for the native speakers and for the rest of us we're like oh 
surprise. So this story is a romance, but it is also a little bit of a mystery because at the beginning of the story, after she turns 17 and she's like her own performer, her uncle dies, okay? Because while she's living at this entertainment house, he is coming to visit her regularly. They have a great relationship. And then one day as he's making his way back to the entertainment house to see her, he is killed by bandits. She's really upset about it, but she finds out that it's kind of connected to the Duke because her uncle was friends with one of his mentors, the Duke mentors, okay, okay, they're connected. And the Duke's mentor and her uncle died in the same bandit attack. And he's like, I don't think this is a coincidence. Um, something is not right. I need your help to figure this out because her uncle left Duke Mong a note that was saying like, hey, she's the key you need her, go get her, she will help you figure this all out. So that was the whole reason that Duke Mong went to go find her in the first place. And she's like, okay. So the tea on all of this is that, okay, he's the Duke of Dreams, right? But his father was the previous Duke of Dreams. And honestly, this was one of my notes. I was always really confused on what his father was accused of. I was confused on what happened. I'm sure it's probably in there and I just like, my brain probably skipped over it. So I'm not gonna like lump this in as like a criticism. It was probably just like, I missed it. So I can't tell you what the original Duke was accused of, but he's essentially like put away in prison by the Celestial Emperor. So he is deemed as the next Duke of Dreams, Duke Mong. His name is Jin Lang. Duke Mong, Jin Lang, was supposed to get married to this girl named, I just looked it up, Raylan. Raylan, right? They were supposed to get married. But then one day she turned into what they call a ravager. And a ravager is a celestial. So like one of those like higher beings, like not like a god, but you, you know, like a celestial. <laughs> they essentially like get corrupted and they turn into these monsters, like the one that attacked them in the garden back at the entertainment house. So it's essentially thought of as like an illness, a sickness, because they, they can't figure out how to turn them back. Um, so she turns into a ravager and jumps off like a cliff at the manor. So um, the Duke's mentor, he starts investigating it because he was like, why did she turn into a ravager that like that, that doesn't make sense. So while he's investigating it, he mysteriously dies along with uh, Shuer's grandfather, uncle oh my god this was such a mistake to wait so long to record this video because now i'm all like discombobulated oh my god the duke's mentor and Shur's uncle die in this attack right but he's like no it's not just random because my uh mentor was really close to figuring out what happened with Raylan and why she turned into a ravager so the thing that they're trying to solve is a what happened to his mentor and her uncle? And B, what what did they find out? What were they close to finding out that um, they got killed for it? Okay, okay. I actually really like this mechanic and I will say this is one of my favorite parts of the book is that, um, so the main part of them solving this mystery is that in Shuer's chin, in her instrument, there are these pearls. And when Duke Mong looks at them, he's like, oh, these aren't like regular pearls. These are like memory pearls, which is essentially when a celestial feels like a, a strong emotion, they're able to cry out these little pearls that will hold their memories. Like imagine this, and like I just like cried it out, boop, and then you just saw the memory of me recording this video. So there's three of them in her chin and they're like locked in there and they can't get them out to view the memories um, without a certain key. Her chin is essentially like a Rubik's cube of clues that'll help them solve this mystery. And the way that they unlocked these pearls is by her playing specific songs. So I'm gonna say like right now, if you are a musical nerd, if you enjoy things of the music variety, this book is for you. I'm not even a music nerd like that much. Like my music tastes are, okay, good. You can't see my K-pop albums. <laughs> Just the mechanic of like her having to figure out these songs and it's even like 
layered on top of that because some of these songs are very difficult to play. So the first song she figures out because it's like it's written on her chin, but not in like a super explicit way. So she plays that one and then it unlocks the first one. And then the secret to the second one is in the memory of the first one. And she has to essentially figure it out based on the tune. She has to Shazam it in her mind. <laughs> to try and figure out what the next song to play is. Simultaneously, while they're trying to figure out this mystery, they are, um, falling in love. The romance part of this is like a slow burn. Imagine like a crock pot recipe that takes like 24 hours to like, for you to actually be able to eat the actual meal. That's what this book is. It is like slow burn to the max. It's really, really cute. And especially like if you're into like a romance where it's like the almost the polar opposite of like spicy, this is for you. Because like sometimes I feel that like romance that is whatever advertised to like a certain demographic of people is always like super like rough and just like really explicit. But this is all very like acts of service kind of like romance, being able to read your partner kind of romance, like it's really cute. For example, there's a part like at the beginning. So when they first have their interaction in the garden, she's playing for him. They set out like this amazing like 50 course meal and he's like not really eating a lot of it. And she notices that and she's like, huh, that's weird. And then when they're traveling together, he she notices again that he's not really eating the meals. And then she like immediately clocks it and she's like, oh, you're vegetarian. And he's like, yeah. I am. She's like, Pookie, why didn't you just say that? And then she orders all vegetarian meals and then turns vegetarian on his behalf. Like even when she's at the estate, he's like, we can get like, we can get meat for you. Like it's fine. And she's like, no, ew, <laughs> disrespectful. Of course I will turn vegetarian for you, Pookie. Don't even ask twice. And in general, like Jin Lang as a character, bruh, I was crying. I was gagging. I wanted to punch myself in the face. I said this about Maxon and I've said this about like a few other like male love interests where it's like doting boyfriend. He is doting boyfriend. Like literally his dialogue is like, oh my God, we have to find, we have to find out the mystery of what happened to our respective mentor slash uncle. And the other half of his dialogue is, hey, are you okay? How much is the entire world and can I buy it for you? Type of dialogue. <laughs> He's just so, oh my God. <laughs> okay, so she also makes friends with the Duke's sister. Her name is Ling Wei and his like brother-in-law because uh, Ling Wei and this dude are betrothed to get married to each other. Name is, his name is Chin Win. So as you progress through the story, you find out a lot about like the outside lore. Well, rather uh, she finds out a lot about the outside lore. There's a lot of like interludes where they kind of explain a little bit more of like the lore, the world building of the six realms. In a narrative sense, Shuer is constantly reaffirming what we are supposed to know as the reader about this realm and the six realms in general and how like everything works. And as we learn more information, she will build up on it um, and like kind of put those pieces together. Almost like when you watch a TV show and they have the like previously on, that's how Shuer kind of delivers a lot of this world building. I'm sure for people that are already familiar with these myths, it might seem a bit like repetitive. For someone who is not, and for someone who is forgetful and was constantly being like, why is the Duke Mong not real? And why isn't he in love with me? I was getting a little bit distracted, let's just say. So um, to have that like be constantly reiterated and like having those pieces like kind of like connected constantly was really helpful. It was really helpful for me to like keep everything on track especially because this is like very lore heavy. Also simultaneously going on throughout the story, she has this like maid named uh, Dun Denro. So Denro is like Loki being super mean to her and is like, um, you are nothing like my previous lady. And that is uh, Raylan. So she's just being super mean to her and like sabotaging her left and right. So Duke Mong was not supposed to have any human visitors. Eventually the celestial emperor and empress catch wind that she's there. And they're like, okay, well, if she's really only here to entertain you, with her music, I want to hear her perform. So she has to go to perform in front of the Celestial Emperor and Empress. So Denro suggests to her, she's like, oh, why don't you play this song? You know, the previous Chin players did it in front of the Emperor and he really appreciated it. And she was like, okay, I will. So she goes and performs these songs. Lo and behold, the song that Denro told her to play 
was actually one of uh, Raylan's favorite songs. And when the Duke heard it, he was so sad that he left. It's really like a like a miscommunication kind of trope as well, because sure is over here like, oh my God, I'm the only one that has feelings for the Duke. Like he does not feel the same way about me. He's in love with this girl, Raylan. Like he couldn't even stand to hear her favorite song. So she's like, oh my God. Um, but then it gets cleared up and he was like, um, actually, this is what happened. So when Raylan turned into a ravager, they believed it was because she was so upset that he was going to break off their engagement and all her negative feelings kind of like made her turn into a ravager. But he was like, that's not possible because she didn't want to get married to me. And she actually asked me to break off the engagement, which he said that he was going to do. And she was supposed to be really happy about it. So he was like, I have no idea why she turned into a ravager. Because actually, Raylan, be who you are for your pride. She's so she was like, I have no desire to marry you, Duke. You're a really nice guy. We can be friends. We can be roommates. We can be really good roommates, but we cannot get married. And he was like, okay, yeah, I'll indulge you. That's fine. So he was like, I have no idea why she turned into a ravager. So they they clear up that communication and everything's like, okay, yeah, funky fresh. Let's get back on track to solving this mystery. All of this, all this ravager business, what happened with his uncle, I'm sorry, her uncle, his mentor, everything all goes back to the story of the flower queen no i'm sorry it even it goes back even further it goes back to the creation of the world so the chinese creation myth is that essentially they needed to build the world but they were going to use the body of a god to do it so they all draw lots and whoever gets the shortest stick has to contribute their body so the god that has to contribute their body everyone is super upset because this is like the most beloved god amongst them and they figure out later, once everything is said and done, once the world is created, that the lots were rigged by the deceiver. So the deceiver is banished to the barren realm for their crimes, for rigging this lot system. Then later on, there is the flower princess and the flower princess falls in love with the demon king. And a theme throughout the story is that all these celestials, all these people, they can't marry for love. They marry just for like the social status or like out of duty. The idea that the flower princess and the like demon king, like they can't be together and the jade emperor kind of like you know he's like you you can't do this absolutely not so she is imprisoned in this tower where she eventually uh, jumps out the window and falls to her death and where she falls blooms these flowers so i call them the demon king but they also call him the moon sovereign either way he's not supposed to be with the flower queen i'm really trying my best to explain the lore aspect of that because i will say it's great that they reiterate it like frequently throughout the book but i do think that it is very heavy in the Chinese mythology aspect of it. So if you're not like locked into this book, you're gonna miss it. And there's so many different myths that play into this story that it's easy to kind of get like a little jumbled from all of them and especially more towards the end, which I will get into. So the flowers that bloomed from where the flower queen died, um, these flowers are what create the ravagers and the ravagers up till now the celestials believe them to be like like it's a sickness it's not something that can be healed and the only way to get rid of them is to kill them but what we find out is that the ravagers are it's actually like a form that the celestials can kind of like take on and the reason that the ravagers kind of like were created is because the moon sovereign which is the person that was in love with the flower queen aka like the demon person he had started a war to kind of free her because she was imprisoned by the emperor so he actually called on the deceiver to help him get these abilities so the deceiver granted them to him but eventually he lost his abilities and he dies so this whole story you're uncovering all these like really really deep deep pieces of lore based on like the creation myth um this story with the flower queen all this stuff the emperor how all these sovereigns and like the cycle of power and all this stuff but the climax of the story so here's like the spoiler part so if you don't really want any spoilers i would suggest avoiding this part of the review okay it's honestly a little confusing so jin lang's mom she does not like shuer very much she's like you're just a regular regular person um why are you here blah 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 like she hates this girl um so she imprisons her in this tower so while she's in the tower she figures out 
that the the evil the true villain in this story is actually the celestial emperor because he is not who he says he is he actually used to be the jade emperor and his reign was supposed to he was supposed to retire essentially which is funny because i think they actually use the word retire he was supposed to retire from his position as the sovereign but he was like no i don't actually want to retire i want to be emperor forever so he steals this like fire skull that will keep him alive forever so he steals that changes his appearance becomes the celestial emperor and then he was the one that also orchestrated for the flower queen to die and the moon sovereign because the moon sovereign ends up like giving up and he's like okay i surrender and he's like no there's no surrender there's only death and he kills him and then when jin long's father the previous duke of dreams kind of figures out he's like i don't think like i think someone like set this all up um that is the real reason he got arrested because he was getting too close to the truth and then jin long's mentor also got too close to the truth and he did that with uh Shuer's uncle and that's why the whole this whole thing happened so the end of the story is essentially her exposing with Jin Lang and Chen Wen and Ling Wei all this stuff that the emperor was trying to hide and they're exposing it to the entire celestial kingdom and they're like oh the ravagers they were always able to be like cured it's essentially them going into like a different like a different state but they're still like their regular regular selves but the emperor knew that but he was he spread the rhetoric that they were like diseased and like this was something bad and they had to kill them and that was the only way to get rid of it which was not true so the end of the story is this massive battle with everyone um jin long encapsulates the manor in the oh my god this is really lore heavy and it's so hard to explain the reason he's called the duke of dreams is essentially he's the sandman he can control dreams and help like make these dream landscapes i guess anyway he encapsulates the manor and they're like okay the only way to get rid of the celestial emperor is to like blow him up also at this point i forgot to explain shuer also becomes a celestial while she's in the tower uh the deceiver is like the spirit that occupies the tower and it's it's essentially like a tower of torture if you will so she's in this tower and the deceiver is like oh i'm gonna help you if you help me and she's like okay so she becomes a celestial and then she also learns how to use the dreaming I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so they're like all fighting. Everything's cool. Her celestial powers are tied to her chin, which is also very cool. Um, so they're fighting and then they're like, okay, we have to blow it all up. But someone has to hold the force field bubble that's on the manor. And Jin Lang is the only person that can do it. So the way that they win this and destroy the uh, celestial emperor is by blowing up the manor with Jin Long and him inside. So, sure, now a celestial and now like uh, able to use the dreaming, she becomes the new like Duke of Dreams, which is like a slay. But Jin Long is dead. He's dead. He leaves her a memory pearl and she like looks into it and one of the things about the memory pearls is that once the person views it it like disappears it shatters um but it won't shatter if that person is still alive and she looks at the memory jewel and it hasn't disappeared so he's still alive so the end of the story is her essentially being like oh he's still alive somewhere i'm i'm looking for him i'm gonna get back to him we're gonna get back together as i have mentioned the lore and the mythology is very very present in this book it is a little confusing just because it's so many different myths all contributing to the same story so it's like if you don't understand how one of these plays a part in it you're not going to understand how all of them play a part in it and if you're not locked in you're gonna skip it you're gonna miss it you need to be locked in which is not to say that it's like unreadable or it's not good i think it's very good and i think it's like super interesting to hear about all these myths it is just a little bit hard to keep track of all of them just because it's like Again, from my perspective, I'm very new to Chinese mythology. I'm not well versed in it as well as like your average reader might be well versed in Greek mythology or Roman mythology. There are things that are very like kind of like household names for a lack of a better term, like Achilles, 
Perseus, Hercules, things like that. Like, you know their stories kind of. So if you hear them referenced in passing, you have like a general grasp where a lot of these things I actually had no idea about. They mentioned briefly in this book some some of the myths that were talked about in uh, Daughter of the Moon Goddess. So I was a little bit more like, oh, okay, like I kind of understand what you're talking about now. But yeah, if you're going into this, like absolutely knowing nothing about Chinese mythology, just like pay attention. <laughs> For me, it was really helpful to like, I was drawing like diagrams, writing down like people's names. Um, but I think like in general, it's not like super, super necessary for you to do that. You can still enjoy it um, as just like a regular reader, especially because the romance, girl, <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. It's definitely a slow burn. I just hate selfishly. I hate that we get so little time with them once they both realize they have feelings for each other. I hate it. I hate it so much. It's just like, ah, uh, the payoff is so like, it's not enough. At the beginning of the story, she's like, mm, I don't like you because you're trying to bite my chin. And he's like, no, I'm not. I'm sorry. My bad. And then they kind of get like a, a mutual understanding, mutual respect because they both have lost in their lives. And they're like, okay, yeah, we have mutual goals. Let's work together. And then she's like, actually, you're like super, you're a super, super nice guy. So doting and actually easy on the eyes. What can I say? So she's like, I actually really like you, but you like this other girl, Raylan, and I, I, I would never be able to replace her, nor would I want to, you know? you've lost the love of your life and I'm so sorry. But then he's like, no, I didn't love her. She didn't even love me. We were friends, we were roommates, girl. And then it's like awful because they're literally in love for two days. And the next day after their initial encounter, she was like, ugh, it's, it, it was probably a one-time thing. We were just caught up in the moment, right? And he literally sees her in the garden, walks up to her and kisses her. And he's like, okay, good to know that wasn't just in my dreams. And I'm like, ugh. This actually is my standard. Thank you. If you are not the Duke of Dreams, if you are not Max and Shreve, if you are not, um, who else am I thinking of? I'm just kidding. Um, but actually I, I could rip out my eyeballs. It's not fair. So my general conclusions for this story, I'm very confused on the dreaming aspect. It's, they describe it as like, yeah, like he can control dreams. So the way that the story ends, she has to take over the dreaming and she has to like, rebuild it and the entire six realms is kind of like foundationally built upon this dreaming so i just i i think i would have liked a better exp it's very like whimsical and i'm like yeah cool i get it dreaming very it's inherently very whimsical i need you to like explain this to me like i was five <laughs> please i'm also a little bit confused about why they had to blow it all up like they literally had to destroy the the dreaming so I was a little bit confused on that aspect of it about like, why, like why did the ending have to happen that way? Why can't they be happy? Why did he have to die? Oh my God. And I felt as though the general plot and the buildup got really intense, I think really late in the story where, I mean, the journey to the manor and her like figuring out that like, oh, we're actually in the celestial realm happens like for a big chunk of the beginning. So for a lot of it, she doesn't even really know that she's in the celestial realm. She doesn't know about this magical aspect of it. And that happens for like a pretty big chunk, which is great for the slow burn aspect of it. But like for the actual like story, the, the lore, the myth, it was a little bit hard to follow because you, like you're like like a slow buildup and then all of a sudden it like shoots up and you're like whoa what happened this is a lot to take in all at once especially because the villain of the story which is the celestial emperor he gets introduced so late in the story like you meet him in passing when she's performing for them but that scene and that interaction mainly focuses on the celestial empress and not the emperor he's very much like a side character and then all of a sudden he's our main antagonist so I would have liked for his introduction to happen a little bit earlier on in the story just so that it was someone that you had in the back of your mind. It's like you've never met this character and all of a sudden they're the villain of the story. It's like, but why? Like you can understand, okay, yeah, he wanted to stay in power forever, but I would have liked if we had known him a little bit earlier on in the story and we had those like inclinations, those like little clues in the back of the narrative as we built up to this revelation in the story. And yeah, as I said previously, I would have really liked if we had a little bit more of that payoff from the slow burn. Their brief moment of happiness is very short-lived, which is fine, I get it. It's like 
it's supposed to be like that, but selfishly, I just, I want them to be happy for a little bit longer. Is that too much to ask? I mean, even in this art print, if you look at her like description of like what she kind of wanted to be portrayed here is like that longing that they equally have for each other, not knowing if their feelings are reciprocated and like the like duality of it all. Overall, like it was a really cute read. I, I definitely love the romance aspect of it. The mystery slash like you know lore part of it i was a little bit confused it left me with a, a, some questions to say the least which i think is just like a reflection of like maybe i just need to learn a little bit more about chinese mythology so i can have a better grasp of that so i'm, I'm definitely going to extend that courtesy and overall i just i really love her style of writing where it's just inherently very whimsical and like the descriptions of these myths their interactions as characters, like everything is just so beautifully written. So I am going to give this an overall score of a four out of five. Now, normally I don't like scoring this way. I've explained it before, whereas like my mentality is that if you take like personality tests, for example, um, it's better for you to answer either like yes or like absolutely yes or absolutely no versus those like in the middle kind of answers because it gives you a better and more accurate result versus if you answer in the middle because those like maybe it's like ew, like being like in that middle spectrum doesn't really give you a accurate or like a well-rounded answer that you're looking for when you kind of take those tests and it's the same with reviews if you score more in that middle range the average overall total rating is skewed to stay in that middle area versus if you do like one star or five stars i do three stars occasionally if i'm like really in the middle if i really can't say like yes this was great or yes this was awful <laughs> i very rarely give one stars i think i've only done it like once again that like middle range is truly like if you're absolutely stumped and you can't like sway one way or the other but overall and this is just my mentality if anyone scores that way that's fine but my mentality and what i think of when going into giving ratings and reviews is that i want to be as like accurate as possible so i can go into like my in-depth analysis why i gave it the score that i did in the written section but for the overall stars i'm gonna do either one or five i'm gonna do one five or three if i'm absolutely stumped i really don't like doing like fours or twos um, but in this instance, I will give it a four. And that is because I would love to give it a five, but truly because of the lore and just things that I wasn't understanding, it affected my reading of it. And again, I think that reflects more on me as the reader. And because it's been so long since I actually sat down and read this book, I think if I reread it, I would have a better experience. And if I knew a little bit more about the mythology, I might be able to get more in depth into it. But because I missed out on that aspect, I think it affected my reading, which is why I am giving it a four. But overall, like the romance, I really enjoyed the general writing style, the explanations of the lore, like all these events that happen throughout the story are very strong. I will say the, the pickup is a little bit slow and a lot is kind of like really pushed into that last act of the book. So it's it's a little bit hard to get into it because that, that last part just has so much going on. So with that being said, that was Song of the Six Realms by Judy I. Lin. Let me know, have you read this book? What are your thoughts? I'm definitely loving this little art print. I am gonna post it on my little wall. I'm glad I finally got around to filming this. It's it's truly been too long and I, I shouldn't have waited this long. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Be sure to follow Judy I. Lin on Instagram. Send some love to the cover artist, which I believe is also Sija Hong. Sija Hong Art, at the very least, is their username handle, if I'm not mistaken. Carissa Susillo the person that made this art print very beautiful again i keep showing this off but i'm i'm gagging i love it be sure to follow me on all my social media at listen to kristen on instagram tiktok and that's it i don't have any other social media um i actually also have a good reads which i mean you don't really have to follow me but you could i guess if you want to anyway yeah so that's it all right i need to get a refill on my water and then we're gonna jump in to the next video so I'll see you in like five minutes. Isn't that crazy?